Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're logging on from in the world. And we know there are many people who do that from um, across the globe uh, for our Infrastructure Intelligence Live uh, webinars. Welcome to this special Infrastructure Intelligence Live webinar, which we're organising as part of our involvement with Green Infrastructure Week, which has been a week uh, of celebrating, as the name implies, um, green infrastructure, sustainability, the role of construction and infrastructure in achieving net zero. Uh, it's the final keynote webinar of Green Infrastructure Week, and I know there's been some brilliant events, uh, all of which you can watch again on the Green Infrastructure Week uh, website. Uh, rather than me garble a long URL, just Google Green Infrastructure Week and it's all there in front of you. Some excellent resources for people to uh, tap into. Uh, today's event, uh, organised uh, as ever in association with BECG, we're looking at making the most of offshore wind. Now, offshore wind has been identified by the UK government, as I'm sure, and I'm sure many other governments as well, as a critical source of renewable energy for uh, the nation's growing economy. And indeed, by 2030, the UK plans to quadruple, yes, quadruple its offshore wind capacity in order to generate more power uh, for the, uh, the, the nation's electricity supply. Now, that's a massive increase uh, in capacity and a bold step and a bold move uh, by the government. And hopefully today, uh, in this um, short 45 minutes to an hour webinar, we're going to look at some of the issues involved in that and discuss whether or not that's feasible, what needs to be done, uh, is everything in place, through hopefully the insights of uh, what I think is a really uh, knowledgeable panel uh, that, we've, uh, that we've got for you this morning, if you're logging on from the UK, that is. Um, we've got speakers from Arup, from the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult, from Blue Gem Wind, and from BCG. Uh, but let's kick off things, first of all, with our first panellist, and, and that is James Theobalds, who is the Renewable Energy Transaction Advice Leader at Arup. James works in Arup's business and investor advisory team, and he leads the work they're doing in renewable energy and the regulated utilities. Um, he uh, has been working in this field for some time and uh, he works across energy infrastructure across Europe, uh, very much involved in Arab's work, supporting energy transition and the move to net zero. So without further ado, James, the floor is yours. Thanks very much um, for the introduction and, and, and delighted to be invited to this industry. Uh, this uh, industrious panel and um, yeah very much looking forward to having some uh, good conversations about some of the um, the key opportunities and I guess key risks and challenges also that uh, the offshore wind uh, opportunity sort of offers us offers us going forwards um, I guess over the course of the last decade or so we've seen some absolutely incredible um, successes in terms of the offshore wind industry, in terms of the way that it's managed to scale up, the way it's managed to drive down costs, um, the way that it's demonstrated that it's a, a very you know, strong competitor and actually has some massive advantages over some of the more conventional ways of, 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 of solving um, the UK's uh, energy supply um, challenges. And I think we're at a point now where, um, you know, given some of the challenges around uh, decarbonisation, around energy security, um, we're kind of opening a new chapter. And I think there are some really kind of interesting questions and challenges um, sort of placed around, um, you know, how we scale up, how we accelerate, um, and how we can almost reinvent our energy system to, to, to meet the net zero challenge. Um, and I think some of the key um, issues that we, that, we, that we face now are around um, how do we deal with the fact that offshore wind is likely to become such a large part of our energy supply system that the whole system needs to adjust and needs to take account of that? And we also need to understand some of the challenges around the time scale, um, the, the, the time imperative, particularly around the uh, net, net zero uh, agenda, which is really driving some of the, some, some of the key challenges around, around how we're going to deliver offshore wind going forwards. I guess, you know, politically, um, Offshore wind is something which has been adopted by, by government policy, 
And um, there is a huge amount of uh, success. There are changes in place around legislation. There are changes in place around energy strategy. There are changes in place around um, net zero and, and, and carbon reduction. There's a huge amount of things which are moving in a very, very positive direction um, to support the accelerated growth of offshore wind. But this whole question around, you know, can we quadruple the output capacity of our supply chain to deliver these projects? What are the things that are going that we're going to need to do in order to, to, to change a 10-year delivery time scale down to a you know a five-year delivery time scale? Um, how do we do that in a way that is sustainable and takes into account all of the needs of the other stakeholders in that process? Some really, really interesting challenges to, uh, to, to, to solve. I don't want to go through perhaps all of those in, in, in huge amounts of detail because hopefully some of that will come out in the conversation and discussion from some of the other, the other panel members. But one of the things which I think is really exciting for the infrastructure industry is it's not just about putting turbines out in the water. It's about how do we develop the ports? How do we develop the transmission infrastructure? How do we think about how um, uh, the regulation will change to enable a lot of this work to happen? And what opportunities will that offer the wider infrastructure industry to, to invest in, in all of the energy uh, system change that needs to happen over the next decade? Thanks very much indeed uh, for that, uh, uh, James. I think it's important that you highlight this thing about time scale as well, because it's often easy for the government, uh, particularly when it's making big set piece announcements, to talk about, um, you know, well, we're going to do this by such and such a time. One would assume that they'd actually made sure that the industry was actually ready uh, to do all of that. Often, sometimes that isn't always uh, the case. Uh, but I think, you know, it'll, it'll be interesting to explore a little bit more uh, on that uh, in the uh, in the discussion. But for now, thanks uh, very much for, you know, for that uh, for that contribution. Uh, our next speaker, and I'm really um, excited to say that we've got uh, Lorna Bennett, who is a project engineer with the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. And, catapult. and if there's anyone that knows about um, the offshore sector and wind uh, power generation, then the offshore renewable energy catapult are the people to uh, to ask. Uh, Lorna has 10 years experience predominantly focused on the renewable energy industry. And I know that from a career perspective, she's really committed to renewable energy, uh, both for the unique challenge, challenge it uh, poses and also for the opportunity to make a difference uh, to society. And I think this is something as well that struck me in looking at this issue in preparation for today's event, that many of the people that work within it are totally committed uh, to the concept of not just green energy uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a better source of, of, um, of energy generation, but because of the difference it makes to people's lives. And I think that's really, really important and, and, and actually, for me, just once again, highlights the role of the people who work in the construction and infrastructure sector. Uh, they care and they believe in what they do. Lord, Lorna, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, and I think that, that last point you made there has uh, never been clearer to us with our current energy crisis that's going on as well, particularly around gas supplies. So the need to move towards uh, green renewable sources is um, never been made clearer to the world than it is at the moment. Um, but yes, as you said, we are the, the offshore renewable energy catapult. We are one of nine sister catapults in the catapult network. And it uh, is basically Put simplest, we are um, the UK's leading centre for research and technology innovation in all areas of offshore renewable energy. So we work with pretty much everyone and anyone who has any interest in trying to help improve um, the build out, development, operations, maintenance, everything that you could think of to do with uh, offshore renewable energy. Um, my particular focus over the last nearly two years now has been looking at the circular economy and the energy transition. So how can offshore renewables help with the energy transition? And a big part of that has become um, a discussion around the infrastructure. As James said there, it's not just about um, the turbines and the wind farms, which are obviously a major part of it, but it's all the port development, it's all the shoreside infrastructure, it's the networks, it's how do we factor in some form of energy storage which we currently don't really have um, so that we can help try and mitigate the energy crisis that we're experiencing at the moment and um, remove away from our dependency on fossil fuels um, 
as a, as a key source um, and how how do we actually it there's just there's so many moving parts and it covers so many different areas uh, there's just there's a huge amount of development and research going on across all of these different areas and how we can can join up all um, these parts and as you said we're looking to uh, quadruple as a minimum our uh, offshore wind output over the next eight years it is now and um, so back in 2019 the offshore wind industry signed the sector deal agreement with the government for a, a minimum target of 30 gigawatts by 2030 when we only had 10 gigawatts installed capacity we now have almost 12 and the, the current ambition is for 40 gigawatts but last week Boris Johnson made an announcement saying that he would like to try for 50 gigawatts so um, a, a, a key aim for that is that's kind of the, the expected capacity that we need to power all UK homes with renewable green electricity so that's the kind of aim and then by 2050 to meet our net zero targets we need to have a minimum of 75 gigawatts which we're now looking at potentially up to 100 gigawatts and um, so these are a lot of numbers that can mean not very much to a lot of people but to me it means we need an awful lot of natural resources and materials and the supply chain is going to need to develop in advance so part of the sector deal from 2019 when we were aiming for 30 gigawatts, we were expecting up to uh, 20,000 new jobs, uh, sorry, 60,000 new jobs in the offshore wind sector to be created. We're now almost doubling that target again. So you can only imagine how many new job opportunities we're expecting to grow out of this. And with the work I'm doing, looking at the circular economy as well, um, with the development of you know, reuse, remanufacturing, refurbishment and recycling, we're expecting between five and another 20,000 and jobs out of a circular economy that's um, maybe not specifically directly linked to, to offshore wind but um, you know it's just it's huge economic opportunities for the UK. Thanks very much Lorna for that and I think um, you just <laughs> you kind of explained the point I was making about government announcements where almost out of the blue um, basically the Prime Minister ups the target uh, at another speech that he makes. Uh, but anyway, yeah, a little shrug of the shoulders there. But I suppose that's kind of, <laughs> when you're working with politicians, that's kind of a thing that you've actually got to uh, roll with those particular punches. But anyway, uh, again, something else that we can discuss uh, later on. And it'll also be uh, uh, interesting in finding out from you a little bit later as well about how people can get involved, how the industry can get involved with uh, the offshore renewable energy catapult as well. Uh, because I think, you know, I, I know that you do reach out um, to firms and organisations in the sector, so it'd be useful to find a little bit more about that in the discussion. Our next speaker uh, is someone literally, I was going to say at the cold face, but that would be an appalling uh, uh, phrase to use, given the fact that we're talking about green energy, but someone who's very much involved uh, in basically delivering it uh, at the end of the day and working with those who deliver it as well, and that's Louise Tibiege, who is the supply chain manager at Blue Gem Wind. Uh, Blue Gem Wind is a joint venture which was originally announced in 2020, uh, which I think opened up a new chapter really in the development of offshore energy in the UK. Um, it simply Blue Energy and also Total Energies, one of the world's largest energy companies, have uh, established a partnership to develop floating wind projects in waters of the Celtic Sea, and, and that joint venture is uh, Blue Gem uh, Wind. Uh, Louise is going to talk a little bit about that and her reflections and thoughts on the issue at hand. Louise, over to you. Thanks, Andy. Yes, indeed, we are a floating offshore wind developer between Total Energies and Simply Blue. We currently have a portfolio of 400 megawatts um, of sites in development in the Celtic Sea, made of a test and demo site and pre-commercial site. And we ambition to deliver those ahead of the 2030 so that uh, it goes positively with the government target. Before the government target was increased from one gigawatt of floating by 2030 to five gigawatt of floating, we always uh, prided ourselves to make a really significant contribution to that target. And now we see that the ambition has increased really significantly, which is a very good news for the sector, but also posing some challenges 
Um, so some challenges on supply chain infrastructures have been touched on a little bit by the other panelists. Um, I'd like to make another point about the timeline and whether 2030 is achievable. I think it touches a lot on the regulatory environment. So from a developer perspective, um, you can see the successful delivery of a project in mainly four milestones, which are the securing of a lease, the securing of a great connection uh, in time, um, the securing of environmental consents and a route to market, which uh, in the UK is mainly secured via the contract for difference auction. So this sets a timeline for development of, of six to eight years. So it means that basically we need to start now in 2022. Um, if you look at the pipeline of floating projects in particular in the UK, there has been some tremendous announcements in Scotland recently with a pipeline of 15 gigawatt of float in offshore wind. Um, but in, in the vicinity of the 2030s, but probably most likely after 2030, 2030, 2035. Um, and in the Celtic Sea right now, the Crown Estate is organizing a leasing round, which will open in 2023. Um, and again, they're aiming at um, deploying four gigawatts, but between 2030 and 2035 so that timeline is is really challenging i think those four milestones are also four opportunities to speed things up um when it comes to leasing we really hope that the relevant authorities will have the ambition to accelerate things but there's not only that it's also about the great connection um here it's really challenged by the lack of infrastructure that used to be sufficient, but is going to fall short of a new target of 50 gigawatt by 2030, obviously. Um, there's a lot of effort right now across the industry to coordinate the planning and the delivery uh, of those great connections. As a developer, what we see right now is that it's a very heated market, even looking at 25, 26. We already get feedback from the market saying that, well, the order book is filling up, which is really great news, but it also means that they'll have to expand their capabilities to take on all these new works, basically. And it's also a great opportunity for UK content. It's typically works where we have UK suppliers being very capable um, to do the works. Speaking about consents, um, the government has announced that they wanted to decrease the timeline for, for the, the consent, which is really positive down to maximum one year. So we'll see if that's um, achievable. And when it comes to contract for difference, I think that the key success factor really is really in providing um, visibility on the auctions, making them uh, uh, simpler. And uh, there's an announcement to organize them on a yearly basis, which um, really enabled more projects to go through that stage gate uh, fast. Um, it's also a matter of budget, to be honest. Um, in the past year, this type of allocation round <clears throat> has been very effective in bringing the cost of technology down, which is going to be a huge challenge for floating wind in particular. Um, so sticking with that kind of system, I think, will be very beneficial for the industry. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Louise, for that. Uh, and again, um, interesting that you talk there about the possibility uh, whether or not these targets can actually um, you know, be achieved. There's absolutely no doubt, um, you know, that the, you know, the, the, you know, this whole area of, 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 of offshore wind can provide um, massive job opportunities and, and, and also opportunities to develop the tech as well, potentially making the UK a world leader in this sector if it isn't already. And, uh, you know, I think that, you know, there are things that hopefully the government will latch on to from the point of view of making sure that we can deliver on these uh, on these ambitious on these ambitious plans um there's obviously um as we've already heard from a number of our speakers a certain amount of politics uh, involved in the plans um for ramping up uh, offshore offshore wind um and our next speaker uh, Jamie Gordon who's director of infrastructure and energy at the communications and public affairs consultancy BECG has had many, many years experience of working with different stakeholders uh, in and around our industry uh, in, uh, and also community groups as well who are often affected by the development that needs to be made in relation to big projects like um, offshore wind uh, as well. And it'll be really interesting as always to hear Jamie's uh, insights on this, uh, on this topic. So Jamie, over to you. 
Uh, thanks very much, Andy. Uh, so as Andy mentioned, I work at a company called BCG and I head up the infrastructure and energy side, or r as we call it. And that's a business that supports all types of, of development, whether they be retail or resi. Uh, obviously, from my side, it's more the kind of airports, wind farms, that kind of thing. Less airports, obviously, at the moment, which uh, some may think is very positive, but a lot of work on renewables. And much of this is the support for the political side of things and helping developers achieve consent, which is one of the reasons I like the INE side, because I'm not much of a political animal despite what Andy just suggested, but I, I'm, I'm not one of these that's going to be lobbying planning committees and things like this. And because of the 2008 Planning Act and the subsequent DCO regime, it tended, and I stress that, to be a non-political process. Um, and it's slightly strange that today I'm actually going to talk a lot about politics um, and maybe, unfortunately, have a bit of a rant. Um, now, we all agree on the direction of travel, you know, from number 10, uh, we've obviously got 50 by 30 now, uh, which is extremely challenging. Um, but there's a lack of detail in the policy behind that, I think, coming out of number 10, unfortunately. The, the recent energy security strategy didn't really give us the ink we were hoping for on how 50 by 30 is going to be supported. I suppose it's a bit like if Boris came out one day and said he wanted England to win the Euros by 2030, we'd probably say Ooh, it's going to be a bit of a challenge, but we win the finals. We might, you know, might just about achieve that and wouldn't really ask much more. But if a few months later he said, well, actually, I want us to win the World Cup, we'd all say, you know, well, what is it going to do about grassroots? What are you going to do? How is that going to be achievable? Are you going to nationalise the Premiership players? We'd all be up in arms wanting the detail. And that's kind of where we are at the moment. It's not dissimilar. And to quote, you know, a famous football manager, it's not a case of life or death. It's more important than that. Um, now, as we've all touched upon, not a, the timelines are really challenging. Not a single offshore wind farm has been approved in England within the set DCO timelines since 2015. And it's getting slower. Um, we've seen recently the amount of Secretary of State's queries for further information at that stage in the process, refusals, even acceptance letters that have had so many gaps in it, they're obviously going to be followed up with a JR. And all this is really slowing up the process. Now, fortunately, obviously, on offshore is in a far better place than onshore. We've seen what happened to onshore in the, the days after the, the announcement, going backwards and forwards, on and off. But offshore does have massive issues. The, the actual turbines may be politically popular and, and have a reduced impact on the majority of the community. But as alluded to, it's the onshore element that is really the political hot potato. And the current approach to design and building offshore transmission was developed when offshore was a relatively new sector. And the target was uh, 10 gigawatts by 2030. It was very much designed to de-risk the delivery of offshore by leaving the project developers in control of building the associated transmission assets to bring the, the energy onshore. Um, there is then a, a coin process, an agreement, as, as mentioned, with National Grid, and that can actually take you then, from that onshore piece, many miles inland. All that is going to need consenting and be potentially hugely unpopular. Um, you're talking then, obviously, the, the reinforcement work the National Grid are going to have to do, so that's, that's potentially overhead lines. All in all, it's converter stations, substations, overhead lines, underground cabling for the developers itself. And we're seeing a lot of this taking a lot of time. Obviously, project speed, which Louise referred to, is going to hopefully allow a lot of this to be wrapped up and consented a lot quicker. But who knows? Again, the devil is in the detail and we're not seeing the detail. One of the things that is happening at the moment is the OTNR, the, the Offshore Transmission Network Review, um, which we're all waiting on. It's due in June. There's been a lot of consultation going on about this one. Um, and we all know how crucial it is. Um, you know, the, the, the onshore, offshore wind rather, projects coming online today have taken more than a decade, as, as mentioned before. So 
you know, this new regime has to really get up and running very, very quickly. Obviously, any regime can't change projects that are currently in flight. So there is a pathfinder process at the moment. But again, how long is that going to take? And I feel sorry for the developers because how, how do they do the maths when all this is, is happening around them? And it's a bit like traffic modelling post-COVID. Nobody quite knows where we are on this. And one of the challenges you've got is that it's, it's kind of holding everything. I mean, there was an open letter from the uh, ESO, the Electricity Tra uh, Systems Operator, following the, the recent Scotwind leasing that Louise mentioned. And in that, they're they quite overt about the fact that there is a possibility to extend licensing time, time scales so that they can align with these new connection offers coming out the holistic network design, which is part of that review. Um, and so we have, they, they stated, we have the off-gem decision on delivery models. They're also saying that there's uncertainty developers over the coming months because of this. So going back to that kind of sporting analogy, it's a bit like telling a developer, you've got to run 100 meters in nine seconds and then saying, no, no, it's eight seconds. And, and hold on, um, I've got to tell you yet yeah, what kind of running shoes you've got to wear. There's just delay, 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 and we don't have the time for delays. Now, the big thing about the, the OTNR is that it's a bit of a political hot potato in itself. Certain areas of the country, like East Anglia, are being really hit by the required onshore infrastructure because, of course, so much of the wind is going to be out there in the North Sea. And many MPs are asking about potential offshore ring mains. There's also the MPI question, multi-purpose interconnectors, which are great, they're fantastic concept. And the idea being that you have, instead of interconnects going from the UK to a and other countries grid, you have an element of it going via an offshore array, which is brilliant. If you have a cable that can take a gigawatt, it means a gigawatt can be sold to that country and a gigawatt to that country, it's two, twice as much away. Who knows the bit going to the other country? Will that count towards the 50 gigawatt target? All yet to be agreed, of course. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of challenges. So, so what's the solution? Well, I think there's, there's project speed is obviously going to be one. We've also got to get more political support. And I think, I do feel very sorry for, for Off-Gem and Bayes on this one. I mean, Off-Gem's remit does not cover net zero at all. I mean, their mission statement makes no reference to it. And it, the, the opening statement, the sentence is, our core purpose is to ensure that all consumers can get good value and service from the energy market. It then goes on, no mention of net zero. So it isn't really within their remit. Bayes is not a very big government department. They employ less people than your company, James, actually, if you look at the numbers. Your company in the UK, they've got 5,000, you've got 6,000, I believe. And, and they're smaller than the levelling up and housing uh, and communities department. They need to be given more resource. You probably need, in my view, a net zero department with a, a net zero czar who has all the clout to drive through policy change at speed. And that's policy change both from the markets, how off-gem operate, and the consenting regime. Now, in, interesting, again, James, I'm giving you another plug here. Um, Arup did a very uh, great report they did for, for Bayes and the Crown Estates on the spatial value of the seabed. And one thing that came out of that, from Louise's point of view, was floating wind must be more readily considered if we're going to achieve the targets. But I think it's actually beyond that. We need to be really creative. Um, I mean, some of these arrays going up are absolutely vast. Is there a possibility that they could be co-located with, with solar? I mean, could you put solar panels on the south facing side of the mast? I'm not an engineer. There might be issues with, with the structure and sea spray and things. But flicker would only be when the wind was coming from that way. And you've got the connection. So if it's a non-windy day, at least you're getting something away. Also, should we be, that, that probably can't be allowed. The, uh, who knows, the rigs from off-gem probably don't allow us that, that, that at the moment. But again, that needs to change if that's an opportunity. Oil fields, there's new exploration being allowed. 
maybe that should only be licensed if the design at decommissioning allows for things like anchorage of offshore wind. There's loads of opportunities to think creatively here. And I think realistically, what we've got to do is also consider the, the storage side of things from Law, Lorna mentioned that early on. And with the MPI's potential offshore hydrogen generation and various other things, again, will that count towards the 50 by 30? There are lots of opportunities for offshore wind to actually really make the most of, of the, the, the target and the policy, but to drive through policy change. And storage is going to be a big issue. There will always be that baseload question, but maybe let's keep that for another day it's a big discussion so in short i think it's a fantastic opportunity for for the sector but we really do need to push the politicians to understand the challenges for us and to understand the complexity of those challenges it isn't just saying 50 by 30 it's also saying to national or off gen so they can allow national grid to underground cables outside of a and b which is the only place they can at the moment if it is enabling an offshore wind 50 by 30 project things like that we need to be driving for so lots to discuss hopefully andy thanks very much for that <laughs> jamie as ever uh, raising a number of questions uh for which there are probably no direct answers at this present time, although obviously we'll try and shed some light on it in the limited time that we have for discussion. I just want to kick off with a uh, a question that's been posed in the chat around um, particularly hydropower. Um, uh, Moses Palomo says that, that hydropower generation, he also mentions geothermal, uh, is often presented with no eligibility threshold. Uh, in relation to um, the, the question he's asking is whether or not it, you, you know it's in line with green market practice in terms of the emissions that are generated from developing some of this stuff. And obviously there would be emissions uh, involved in generating uh, or rather in developing some of the big plants that will be needed to actually build some of this kit in future. And I just wonder whether or not, you know, um, particularly Laura, Lorna has any comment in relation to that, what she thinks about that kind of trade-off between the emissions developed uh, and obviously the end goal of, you know, obviously green energy. Yeah, I just, um, I was at a, an Institute of Mechanical Engineering conference a couple of years ago around the, the discussion of hydropower. So that was all power um, generated by water. I was there talking about a, a tidal stream project, but um, a large portion of the, the conference attendees were coming from your traditional hydropower, hydro dam um, experience background. And there was a, a great deal of frustration um, with that audience around, as Jamie's just pointed out, um, the politics and policy of trying to progress projects. So um, we only have, I think it's three reverse pump storage hydro facilities in the UK. That is the total amount of our energy storage um, capacity in the UK. And um, there was three new proposals that I remember hearing about, um, as I say, a couple of years ago um, that were basically stalled or being pushed back or declined um, because hydropower needs to be in traditionally more remote rural areas where you don't have large centres of population. Um, so you've then got to transport power from there back to where people are, where power is going to be used. Um, and these three proposals were being declined because they were in already at capacity areas within the grid and they were seen as net contributors to an already over capacity grid rather than what their true purpose would be, would be net extractors as a form of energy storage. And um, so there is a, a kind of mismatch in the understanding of the people reviewing the applications and what the policies are for the, the, the grid development. Um, then you've got projects like the, the Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon, which uses hydropower principles to generate energy. And again, not going to get into the politics of that. I'll leave um, that side of things to Jamie, who seems to have a better head for not going off on a rant. 
Um, <laughs> but uh, we've we've all seen that the, the issues around um, that particular development, and there's been several others suggested, um, but we don't have an example project like that yet um, where things would be you know that would be the baseline um, for any future developments proposed um, so there, there, there's again it comes back to what what Jamie was saying there's delays constant delays pushbacks years go by where nothing happens and we are running out of time to meet any of our 2030 never mind our 2050 targets um, and in terms of the the carbon emissions um, yes these large structures tend to be made from concrete, but there are so many research projects going on at the moment and technologies coming through for the decarbonisation of concrete um, and you know, improving the, the, the carbon emissions of the manufacture of um, you know, concrete and structural materials. Uh, then obviously we've got projects looking at carbon capture and things as well. So there's a, there's a lot going on in a lot of areas to try and address some of these, but the policy, the politics and the the common sense needs to go with that as well. Thanks, Laura. I just want to sort of continue a little bit in that vein because Jamie did flag up some of the delays in the process. Now, obviously, some of these delays are for good reasons. You can't just develop stuff without taking any uh, due cognizance of the local community and so on and so forth. However, it, I, I would have thought it makes it difficult to plan for those who are working in the sector as well. And I just want to turn to James to get his thoughts on uh, is this an easy sector to be planning in, planning your workload, lining up supply chains? And I'll come on to Louise on that front as well, especially when it seems to be that there are some quite significant delays in the process. Uh, that's number one. And also, I encourage that the government will speed things up along the lines that Jamie suggested that they needed to. James. So, so one of the things that I think the industry has benefited from massively over the last decade has been the fact that we're in a basin where we've got a whole load of markets that sit next to each other. So the UK, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, um, which have enabled a kind of a supply of projects into the market that the supply chain has been able, that the, the wider European supply chain has been able to sort of organise itself around and to sort of scale up and invest alongside. But what we're asking for now is a massive acceleration in terms of project delivery. And I think one of the key challenges for the supply chain is having that visibility of the pipeline and being able to plan investments that are not built around just the delivery of one project, but developing supply chain capacity to deliver a portfolio of projects for a number of different customers. And I think, you know, as Jamie was raising before, that the nature of some of the challenges around the regulation, the market design, providing that visibility and that kind of clear runway that can enable um, the manufacturing and supply chain side of things to make the investments needed is, is not quite there yet. And I think the supply chain is, de is demonstrating that it can kind of keep pace with the regulatory framework. But if we're really going to deliver on the ambition and the targets that have been set by government, the regulatory framework needs to change, but it needs to take into account all of the different stakeholders involved in those processes. There are some really good reasons why projects get delayed or why things need to be considered or looked at in more detail. And thank Jamie again for plugging the recent report that we, we issued with Bayes and, 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 and Awari Catapult. Of course, it helped us deliver that report. So, um, you know, really interesting looking at some of those different considerations and the whole discussion and debate around what are the important questions that need to feed into the redesign of that, 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 that policy and that, that market design and the regulation? That needs to happen really, really quickly. Um, we've got OTNR, which is happening in the background. That's dealing with another really, really complicated question of how does all of this stuff come together and how do we move away from a space where every project is being thought about in isolation to us thinking about a wider integrated network and a transformation of the energy system. Um, the other thing perhaps which wasn't mentioned as well was the announcement to form uh, the FSO, the new energy system regulator, whose job it will be to coordinate big energy decisions that span across electricity and gas and offshore and onshore. So there are definitely things which are happening. The question is whether they're happening quickly enough to deliver on the ambition of 2030. Thanks, James. Louise, you, your whole role is involved in working with the supply chain. You know, what's your observations on that? You know, whether it's, you know, there are some real challenges in that area as a result of maybe some of the delays that we've heard about today. 
Mm -hmm. um, so to, to give you an idea, an example, so right now in, in, within Bridgem, when we're working on the delivery of our first test and demo project, which is 100 megawatt, um, and we are in the process of having a well, procurement exercise to basically build the farm offshore and onshore, um, what we're finding is that it's it's pretty timing sensitive and we're planning that quite early in comparison to the commissioning date, which is in 2026. So basically, we, and this is market practice, which is fairly normal, but um, the market is used to planning with this kind of four year ahead or five year ahead. Um, we need to have the outcome of the procurement process and some offers from the supply chain, then in turn to be able to go to the um, revenue allocation process where we will bid on the price and we will guarantee that price to the government and the government will guarantee the execution of the contract for 15 years. Um, of course, any delay in, in, for example, securing consent and then postponing the participation to the revenue mechanisms or any delay in the revenue auction itself, then voids a little bit the procurement process because um, you're asking your supply chain not to take commitments on prices and volumes and qualities four years in advance, but five, six, seven. Um, so I'd, I'd say that there's a boundary where this is a normal range of risk that developers are used to work with. Um, and uh, it's quite normal to be fair. I think it's getting complicated for the supply chain right now in the context of very volatile prices. Um, the offshore wind sector in particular is extremely sensitive to steel prices, for example. Um, so we're going to get this challenge either way. Um, it's, it's helping to have clear visibility indeed on, on the regulation. I think a few years delay is, is still something that developers had to work with, honestly, for the past decade. So I'm not, we're not going to pretend that we don't know how to do that. Um, what's getting really challenging is when the entire system is reconsidered. So, for example, what's happening with OTNR, I think the sooner we know then what is going to be the process for a developer to apply for a grid connection to secure it um, is going to be really beneficial than to have a proper plan on then how do we develop the engineering, do we need to procure it ourselves, etc., uh, rather than to stay in that gray zone, which is a bit tricky at the moment. Thanks, Louise. Uh, just flowing from that, there's a question from Nicholas Rigby in the chat where he asks, what practical steps can industry take to move towards a solution to some of the grid challenges and the knock-on environmental impact uh, that challenge the consenting of these offshore wind farms? Uh, Jamie, do you have any thoughts on that practical steps industry could take? Yes, I mean, co-hosting is a, a, probably the best solution that's available. At the end of the day, transmission of electricity is always going to need wires, and there's only two things you can do with wires, either put them above ground or below ground. Um, if you are going to put them below ground, there is the opportunity for co-hosting through ducting, a, a good example being Battenvall's recent two developments off uh, East Anglia, Norfolk Vanguard and Norfolk Borealis. Um, where they they ducted and were able to run both projects through the same. So that means you're only putting in one trench, a huge reduction there in the environmental impacts. But I think also the OTNR and, and the idea of enabling the coordination of the network is has the potential to hugely reduce the environmental impacts, both on and offshore. I mean, I, I've been talking mainly onshore, but let's not forget there are offshore implications from a marine environment perspective as well. And I think the, 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 the coordination is going to become more and more of an issue. We've seen, uh, you know, actually one of the projects I just mentioned, Norfolk Vanguard, was uh, refused at Secretary of State, uh, no, JR stage, because of the cumulative impacts with another offshore wind project in one particular area where all the wires were coming in um, and that hadn't really or, or it was uh, stated that hadn't been looked at. So I think it's a question of coordination, certainly from, from the markets. That's the only way you could reduce the, the environmental impacts, because unfortunately, 
electricity transmission needs a cable. There's there's no way around that. Uh, that's a, going back to the, the supply chain thing, I think cables are going to become a supply chain issue. Um, you know, that, that there's only so much production in the world and the amount of cables we're going to need to, to enable 50 by 30 is absolutely huge. And don't forget, it's not just us doing this. It's every country um, is, is driving towards a net zero and the need for more cables. Thanks, Jeremy. One of the things that strikes me about this, and, and there's a question about this in the chat, and I'll get to it in a second, but I was fortunate uh, last week to visit the, the Tease Work site uh, down at um, down at Redka, because that's the way you pronounce it. I, I was born in Teesside, so it was quite an emotional visit for me. My dad is an ex-steel worker as well, to see what's happening down there in terms of the, the you know the land clearance in preparation for the big um, you know wind turbine factories that are going to go up. Uh, hopefully the green economy uh, in action there, and hopefully that does actually you know come to fruition and also provide some much needed local jobs good jobs for the you know for the local area but it also reminded me i remember when the uh, the offshore wind farm was put up just off the coast of redka uh, in 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 the northeast and i remember initially some people were a bit you know oh, i'm not sure about that but now people actually just go there to look at it you know it's almost a tourist attraction and you know i, I mean I, I actually you know maybe i'm just a bit sad but i actually think they could look quite beautiful actually um, you know, of all the infrastructures out there in the world, I think you know that you know they look really smart. And and Tarun Kumar Singh uh, asks a question in in the chat: um, What are the popular locations that these projects will take place in around the UK? Uh, and and again, I don't know whether or not Lorna has any insights about because if we're talking about a big expansion in offshore wind, then clearly there's going to have to be more of these wind farms springing up all over the place. So, you know, without, you know, obviously being a hostage to fortune or anything like that, or setting any rabbits away that we don't need to, uh, do, do you have any idea about where some of these locations might be and what that might mean? Because for me, when you see these places, they're almost like a living and breathing advert, you know, for brilliant infrastructure in many ways, green infrastructure. So uh, do you have any insights on that, Lorna? Yeah, so... Um, all of the leasing rounds um, have been discussed already through running through the Crown Estate and Crown Estate Scotland. They have proposed sites. Um, so there are, there are maps on Renewable UK website, um, Scottish Renewables website and the Crown Estate websites as well, showing the proposed areas for developments. Now, these will be areas um, away from major shipping routes, um, away from major um, fishing grounds um, and other you know, environmental areas of sensitivity. So um, there, there, and then obviously you've got the, the seabed, um, bathymetry and topography and um, the environmental conditions. So obviously wind resource um, being the key for wind power. Um, there's multiple studies and um, you know, publicly available data on uh, wind tracking around the UK, obviously being an island is ideally positioned to have offshore wind. Um, and as I say, all these other areas. So, um, you know, they'll be they'll be out of the way of major like ferry lanes or shipping routes and um, fishing grounds um, is a very sensitive area for the sector as well, politically looking at Jamie again. <laughs> um, and then, you know, there, there's certain areas as well where the water might be, it was definitely too deep for a fixed bottom, but we're, that's why, as Louise said, you know, we've got, up to 15 gigawatts just been consented through the Scotland round in Scotland because the, the waters are much deeper around the north of the country as well. So um, yeah, all of these areas have already been looked at. The Crown Estate has a, a detailed map of um, areas that are going to be available for consenting um, going forward. So um, yeah, you can you can get an idea from several different places of if there's any anywhere you're particularly worried or interested in. <laughs> Uh, maybe, maybe just to take the opportunity to jump in and plug the, the the recent report. There's a lot of discussion in the geospatial report that we've we, 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 we recently published with the Crown State and the debates that talks about some of the important stakeholder decisions and reflecting on the fact that Lorna went through very eloquently. There's a whole load of stakeholders who've got very, very strong and important views around a lot of these areas and a lot of the decisions that need to be made going forward to all um, need to think about how these views are balanced against each other and, and, and you know, what changes might need to happen in terms of regulation to enable projects to be deployed um, more quickly. I think one area perhaps where we, um, you know, see opportunity for a lot more further thought 
is around um, how the redesigned the, the, the national transmission system will need to um, think about where the best places are for building these projects, but also how you get the energy that's been generated to the places where it's needed in the most efficient way. Thanks very much, uh, James. I, I want to finish off now with a with a final question to all of our and ask the same question to all of our uh, panelists. We started off the conversation about um, talking about the government's, the UK government's ambitious plans uh, going forward. And I'm going I'm to try and be positive here about how we can actually deliver uh, on these plans. We know there are obviously some challenges, some bumps in the road. Uh, you know, the government sometimes moves the goalposts. But what is the thing that you think the industry can do? And also through that, the government, because I don't think we should be shy of advising government because we are the experts at the end of the day, in order to make sure that these ambitious plans are actually um, are actually achieved. And I'm going to start that one off um, with Louise, if, if I may. What do you think? that really needs to be done to make sure that we can uh, continue at pace to achieve these these targets. Yeah, thanks for finishing on a high note. I also think that it's uh, really good news to have these kind of targets. Um, I think in, in order to deliver that, there's a collective effort to be done from government and regulatory side, developer to progress the pace. And I think what the industry can do at the moment is to... Um, become aware of the size of the opportunity um, and how that fits in their strategy. Um, I do believe that there's a number of areas that will tremendously benefit from investment in the UK, um, support infrastructures, but also we talked about it, uh, the greed upgrading uh, is going to bring a massive opportunity for UK businesses as well. So I do hope to see investments in electrical components, manufacturing, and cable manufacturing, others, et cetera. We already see a sort of skills shortages right now in the UK in the industry um, that will grow wider. So maybe there's collective effort here as well to train the right people and, and bring all those people in the industry in the future so that it's more sustainable. Thanks, thanks Louise. Some important points made there about the skills uh, challenge as well and, and using this to actually hopefully bring in the skills that the sector needs those skills of the future uh james your thoughts on this what what can the industry do to make sure that momentum is kept up on this i'd say be, be bold and, and and be brave um and, and have faith that um you know some other things that need to change around uh, the regulation the market design these things will happen um the opportunity is enormous not just in the uk but also um, you know, within the wider European geography. And, and that's a really, really helpful kind of mitigator in terms of risk. Um, there are lots of markets which are equally trying to grow rapidly and some really, really key opportunities, particularly around things like floating wind, um, for the UK to really put a flag in the ground and say, these are the bits of the market that we want to own and develop. And when we look at things like the Intel leasing round, which might bring new opportunities coming forwards even earlier than perhaps Scott Wind or or tender round four, there are some real things to kind of grab hold of and say, actually, let's make some strategic decisions that have some risk attached to them, but could could have huge rewards as the market continues to grow. Thanks, James. Uh, Lorna, you're obviously intimately involved in all of this. Um, but, uh, why are you optimistic about the future uh, in relation to uh, in, in relation to this sector? Oh, that's a that's a very good question. I think it's as you say, it's it's we need it, um, uh, and it is just it's a huge opportunity. Um, going back to a point you made right at the start, Andy, you asked the question, but actually, yes, the UK is world leading in our offshore wind development. Um, anyway and again we are leading the way on the development of floating wind as well so we have the world's first two commercial floating wind farms in scotland already and we're talking about another 15 gigawatts of floating wind farms within the next 10 years so um, we already are leading the world we are already exporting our knowledge and experience around the world or a catapult to that extent has just um, a couple of years ago opened an office with a collaboration agreement in China. We've just signed a, a memorandum of understanding with the Indian government for developments over there as well. So we are already exporting our knowledge and experience around the world. Um, and exactly um, as Louise said, we need, you know, there's a huge opportunity for skills development, 
apprenticeships cropping up everywhere you know there there's a there's such massive opportunities for jobs skills economic growth um, and we're already um, world leaders in exporting our knowledge and experience all over the world thanks very much lorna jamie you rightly highlighted earlier some of the challenges involved in this but in closing give us some reasons to be optimistic about the future uh, in this particular sector I, I think, you know, I may have been a bit negative early on, but I think we have to hand it to Boris. You know, he has said 50 by 30, not 20 by 30. And it, it's great we have a government that is driving this. I think one of the things the industry as a sector can do, and as Lorne has mentioned, we are world leaders here. And we, we should really be using that, maybe advising government more in the sense that there, there should be some form of more compliance to fast track the process. So I imagine some kind of guidance that, that if you have a, a 50 by 30 badge of honor in some way, your, your project is enabling that. You have a set of guidelines, whether it be uh, processes for doing your, your environmental impact assessment, whether it be design guidelines, that if you are adhering to those, the whole process is fast tracked through the consent regime. And that will mean that the things, the supply chain knows what they're doing, government knows what they're doing, and things can get consented a lot quicker. So it's basically working with government, with the expert, work up these guidelines. Uh, the, the nuclear industry does it the whole time and just then build to that set specification and build quickly. Thanks very much, Jamie, for finishing on that optimistic note. And I don't think you were negative at all earlier. I think it's right on, on, on this and many other issues that we do actually look at the challenges because it's all right for the government, you know, and it's great that the government is actually coming out with these lofty ambitions and we need that, you know, we need that vision, particularly in this area. But also I think at the end of the day, the industry that has to deliver it uh, needs to be listened to uh, as well. And I was really struck by... Uh, James's comments about being bold and being brave. We've heard that on many occasions at our Infrastructure Intelligence Live webinars on a number of issues. And I do think the industry does need to speak out, yes, in a constructive way, but not hide its knowledge under a bushel, to, to mix my metaphors, uh, as it were, because I think, you know, this industry has um, a lot of expertise and skill and knowledge uh, around these issues. And I think we do need to actually show the government and others that we know what we're talking about and that we are integral in delivering, um, you know, in delivering these ambitious plans. Uh, I'm sure there's all sorts of other stuff we could have discussed uh, on, this, uh, on this issue, but as always, time uh, is against us. Um, it's been really good to, to hear the insights uh, today and, and, and big thanks to James, to Lorna, to Louise, and to Jamie uh, for contributing uh, on this issue uh, at this webinar on Offshore Wind as part of Green Infrastructure Week. If you want to get more information uh, about the issues around sustainability, uh, you can watch all the events that have taken place in, during Green Infrastructure Week uh, via their website, which is greeninfrastructureweek.com. Uh, just go online and see that. Uh, we know that the Green Industrial Revolution that the government have been talking about is a massive undertaking. Um, £12 billion of government funding alone, a further £36 billion of private investment to deliver that. Clearly, the offshore wind element of that is a really important side of that as well. And I just go back to that visit that I undertook uh, to uh, Teesside last week. Uh, basically, it's clear to me that green infrastructure is extremely important, not just to the country. I also think it's important to the nation uh, as well, because if we talk about a sector that is actually changing people's lives and actually doing good as well for the future, then it's it's the construction and infrastructure sector. And I think things like offshore wind, the whole sustainability agenda is, is one that's really important for our industry and one that we need to promote uh, at, uh, at every opportunity. Speaking of doing good uh, for communities uh, and, and speaking of doing good via infrastructure and construction, don't miss our next event, which takes place in a fortnight's time. It's our second uh, social value conference 
Leveling Up and Social Value, Friday the 13th of May. Uh, do register for that via the Infrastructure Intelligence website. We know we're going to have a really good discussion and debate around all issues related to social value and levelling up at that particular event. Once again, thanks to everybody for logging on. Thanks to all those who are watching again. Uh, I've been Andy Walker, the editor of Infrastructure Intelligence. Big thanks as well to the good folk at National uh, at the Green Infrastructure Week and also a massive thanks to our partners BECG for making all of this possible. Hope you have a great long weekend for those of you who are celebrating a bank holiday. Some of you won't be, but for those that are, enjoy the extra day off if indeed you get it. And we'll see you next time. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.